Wow. Okay. Great. <laughs> um, hey, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining. It's great to be here at Android Summit virtually. I mean, would I love to have it physically? But yeah. Um, so hi, I'm a, I'm your host Akshay Chordia. I'm based in Berlin, Germany. I work as an Android engineer at Clue over here, which is a female health company. Um, and I'm also a Google developer expert for Android. So today we are going to talk about something which many people are excited about that is Kotlin flow. So before we dive into Kotlin flow, let's rewind a little bit and look at what Kotlin gave us that is coroutines. So basically coroutines, uh, are, they simplify asynchronous programming in general, like and especially on Android. And uh, so here is an example of synchronous function called Sheer user, which internally loads the user from the database. So uh, when this function load user is, uh, is called, it blocks the current thread and waits till the user is loaded from the database. This blocking is bad because at the moment, the whole UI is frozen, making the user unhappy. Something like this. <laughs> and then once the data is loaded from the, from the database, the render function is called, which renders the user's data on the UI. So there are like multiple ways to tackle this. You could use Rx Java or you know use async task, which is not deprecated, but you you would something use something like that. Um, so let's look at like how we can solve this problem using coroutines. So let's start by taking the original synchronous fun function again, the show user function. And uh, so first, what we will do is mark the show user function with the suspend keyword. Of course, you will need to mark the the load user as suspend too, because since we also want it to run on the background thread. So uh, you can see that by marking it as suspend, it will already, uh, like, it will already run in the background thread. But there is a problem. The render function needs to be called from the UI thread since we know that as an Android engineer, whenever we touch the view hierarchy, you need to, we need to do all the, the view hierarchy stuff from the UI thread. So we need to call the render function from a UI, UI thread. So this can, uh, so for that we use a function called as with context, which allows to switch the thread inside the inside the suspending block, and so here we'll we will change the thread, um, change from background thread to the main thread, and then call the render function, and and that's it. That, that that's pretty much how you would convert a synchronous function into asynchronous using coroutines. So, uh, so let's look at how it, this will work internally. So it will we will start off by calling the show user function. Since it marked as suspend, it will switch to background thread or the thread specified while launching the coroutine. We will see how to launch one. Um, and then the user will be loaded from the database on a different thread, uh, while the main thread continues to go ahead without waiting for anything that is not freezing or not blocking the user experience. And then it, uh, it will switch back to main thread because of the width context, uh, and then call the render, uh, render function on the main or the UI thread. So basically, uh, the thing to remember is like a suspend function can only be called from another suspend function um, or from a coroutine scope. Yeah, or from a coroutine scope. So basically, a coroutine scope represents the score, scope of the coroutines. Basically, each coroutine needs a scope to run in. And when the scope is destroyed, all the running jobs inside the inside that scope is like stopped or canceled. Uh, you can think of uh, in terms of like subscription in, in uh, when you compare it with Rx Java. And usually these coroutine, sc uh, these coroutine scopes are associated with lifecycle for simplicity. For instance, on Android, uh, you can think like each, uh, on Android, like each activity has its own lifecycle, right? So um, you could associate a coroutine scope with this lifecycle. So, um, so let's look at an example to under help understand this better. So for example, in order to call our show user function from a normal function, we would need a coroutine scope. So on Android, these scopes uh, are already implement, some of the scopes are already implemented for us. One of this is like the lifecycle scope. And this is part of the lifecycle KTX library uh, from the Jetpack components. It is provided to use coroutine function in activity or fragment. So it's a coroutine scope, uh, which is tied to the life cycle of, uh, of activity or a fragment. Yeah, and, uh, and it, provides the, it provides the magic of automatically clearing or canceling all the jobs 
uh, running in the specified scope. So whenever like the activity is destroyed or the fragment is destroyed, the scope will be cleared and all the running jobs inside it, like all the coroutine jobs will be canceled or like cleared basically. And then, uh, uh, so the launch function over here is how you start a coroutine. There are like multiple ways. One of them is launch. So launch will immediately start the coroutines. That means that coroutines are hot in nature. This is also one of the reasons why coroutines are not replacement for reactive streams. So basically you can think of a coroutine scope um, as a subscription management system associated with the life cycle. So this concept is called a structured concurrency and this is what makes Kotlin coroutine so powerful and also helps developer, uh, like helps developer from leaking the job or the subscription uh, for, for your coroutines or flow. So let's compare, come, at, uh, come to a very important question like why Kotlin flow? Why should you like even consider using Kotlin flow? Like there are like so many good alternatives available out there like Rx Java. So uh, why Kotlin flow? Uh, with growing usage of Kotlin and the love, of, love for Kotlin coroutines, people expressed a lot of interest in having a pure implementation of Rx Java to leverage all the amazing feature with, which Kotlin provides. So, but the, the Kotlin team faced a confusion, like um, should they create, you know, some sort of a magic on top of Rx Java to leverage the Kotlin features or build a whole new library from scratch. So in case you don't know, Rx Kotlin does exist, but it cannot re really leverage all the Kotlin features. Um, but it's like, uh, uh, it's like uh, and it's built on top of Rx Java. Um, but to me, at the end, it's important that any new library uh, raises the bar compared to any existing library out there. And it's not just an ex like, not, it's not just an replica with slight improvement. And and Kotlin Flow does the uh, does raise the bar. So let's see like what makes it so special to raise the bar. So um, first off, is like Kotlin provides null safety in the stream. That means you cannot send null values in the stream. This is not something new. Like Rx Java two has it. Also now three has it. Um, the second point is like interoperability. Uh, so basically you can, um, so flow, flow like provides an easy APIs to convert flow to any reactive stream. Like you can convert the flow to Rx Java flowable or observable or the reverse. Also you can combine flow and coroutines. Um, so to have that interoperability in the both, we will see, we will see this later, um, in, in the, in the slides. Uh, you can, um, the third is like, you can, um, is third one is like the Kotlin multi-platform. Basically, like you can use Kotlin coroutines and flow on any of the supported plat supported Kotlin platforms like JVM, JS, you know, native iOS, um, or also you can use it in Kotlin multi-platform projects and put it in the common code or the shared code for your KMP projects. Um, and one more nice thing is like there is no special handling for back pressure. Like there, literally, there are like pretty much no operators uh, for handling back pressure because this is like magically handled by the suspending nature of coroutines. There are a few uh, operators though, like more or less like the latest ones, like if you want to, um, you know, uh, skip the, all the previous value and just pick the latest one. But it's, uh, there are like, but like unlike Rx Java, there are like very few of them. And then coming to the operators, there are like very few operators, not because they are not built, but it's because, because of uh, Kotlin's extension function magic and also because of suspending nature of uh, coroutines. Because of the suspending nature of coroutines, uh, like they could, uh, you, we, we could like have a single operator, which is for both the things, like for synchronous and asynchronous um, APIs. So this drastically cuts down the number of operators which Kotlin Flow has. So, uh, and also like the perks of structured concurrency, which we saw the coroutine scope, et cetera. So uh, at this point, now you know like how special Kotlin flow is. Let's look at like what it is. Uh, so Kotlin flow is based upon the reactive stream, similar to Rx Java, is this, it follows the same reactive, uh, reactive stream specification. Um, uh, so when you look at a flow as a newbie, you can think like uh, it's, it's very similar to a list or a collection, just it's cold, we will see. Um, and, and, and similar to a list or a collection, it has, it has a bunch of operators like map, switch map, flat map, uh, filter, etc. Um, and it's built on top of coroutines, which gives us, uh, which gives the magic of uh, structured concurrency basically. And the key difference is uh, compared to a list. It's like, it's cold in nature. 
So let's look at some of the basics of flow to, uh, to get the game started. So essentially like flow uh, uh, with flow, there are like two components uh, that is emitter and collector where emitter emits new values, the collector receives those values. So here is an example emitter, which is like emitting this three emojis uh, upstream. So, and this, um, this flow is like returning a flow of string, very similar to how you would return a list of string. So there are like various ways of creating a flow uh, using something called as flow builder. So they are essentially functions provided by Kotlin coroutines library. Um, so they internally create the instance of flow for us. Uh, we will see one of one of them in detail a bit later. And since uh, flow is cold, nothing inside the flow builder block will be called until there is a subscriber or a collector observing those values. Yeah, no. Uh, yeah, and then um, so what's happening? Sorry about that. Animation hiccups. Okay, so let's look at the collector side, the, the second component of flow. So here we have a main function which gets the flow inside the run, run blocking function. For people who haven't used coroutines, run blocking function is a blocking coroutine. Uh, it's a blocking coroutine scope basically. That is, it will block the current thread until everything inside it is completed. So we need the coroutine scope since collect function um, is a suspend function. So, uh, uh, so is emit. We will see ahead why they are like suspend functions in first place. So uh, let's understand like how these two components work together to create the uh, to to create the flow magic. So initially, the main function calls the stream function, uh, and this the stream function will immediately return the flow, and then uh, then we will call the collect function on the flow, which essentially means that we are subscribed to the emitter. And then uh, the emitter starts emitting this value sequentially uh, and the collector receives them and prints in this case. And, the, and then the same loop happens uh, emitting the next value until, uh, until the whole stream is, uh, and this, like this goes on until the, uh, there is no more values. And that's when the execution moves out of complete, uh, out of collect, sorry, and is complete. So let's, like, let's dive in a little more deeper and see how things are working internally. So as I mentioned before, like flow is based upon two components, like the collector and the emitter, essentially like they are interfaces. Um, and the following represents the interface for collector, which exposes the collect function. And here is the emitter interface, which allows emitting values. The key thing to note over here is both the functions are suspend. And this is what allows the magic of interoperability with coroutines and also gives us the perks of having structured concurrency um, with flow. And the funny thing is like the, the whole mechanism of uh, flow is essentially emit, call, emit function calling collect function and the collect function calling emit function. It's just like, it's just calling each other. It's really good. And, and, and because of, uh, since these two functions are also suspend, uh, the, that is why there are like, uh, there is no special handling needed for back pressure. So as you can see, uh, coro flow loves coroutine also because it's built on top of it. So let's say you have a function which loads uh, some data from the database. Since this operation takes time, you would ideally want to perform this uh, in a background thread. So to, to make it suspending, we would just, to perform it in, on the background thread, we would just mark it as suspend. Uh, so it just perform on the background thread. And the funny thing is, uh, you can just directly call any coroutine function inside the flow block. So you don't need the scope in here. So you can just, because since the flow uh, builder here is a, accepts a suspending lambda, you can pass any coroutine function inside the flow block. So essentially it's like directly calling uh, another uh, function. And like I said, like that's because of, uh, that's because the flow builder over here accepts a suspending lambda. Um, and then since also both the collector uh, collect and emit functions are suspend itself, which is just great. Yeah. Um, so let's look at like idea core ideology of flow and how they make our life easier. So the, the first off is um, context preservation. Uh, so this is the where like, uh, so with flow, when you like, whenever you want to define or switch the thread, you can do so by calling an operator called as flow on which takes in a dispatcher, uh, which in this case is IO. 
So this sets the operator like so this operator sets the specified thread only upstream. So anything above the flow on operator will run on IO thread. Anything below it uh, might run on some different thread, but which is definitely not IO. So this concept of preventing context from leaking downstream is called as context preservation, where the context is like encapsulated and it's never allowed to go downstream. So basically, there's only one way to change the context of the flow that is upstream. So when you compare this uh, with RX Java, where it's like super confusing, especially for beginners to understand like which thread their code is going to run on. Like you can look at this example, like it's even though there's subscribe on computation, it's still going to run on IO thread. It's like uh, the second one is kind of ignored. So it's like tricky to understand, especially as a beginner. And uh, combined with the fact that there is also another operator to change thread, uh, that is the observe on operator, which again gives a different behavior. It's a complete face palm moment. And like also a, a huge debugging moment. Um, so this is the, the second, uh, so exception transparency is the second principle of uh, our ideology of flow. So flow implementations like never catch or handle exceptions like that occur in the downstream flows. So basically they only catch uh, exceptions upstream. This is again due to the context preservation principle, which we saw at the beginning. Um, and there's only one operator um, to catch error or exceptions in Kotlin flow, which is the catch operator. So let's look at an example. So let's look at the previous example of a flow, which tries to get the value from the database and emit. As, in, as you can imagine, anything can happen while loading from the database, which might throw some sort of an exception and you would like to handle that. So very similar to a try catch block, a flow has a catch operator, which will catch, uh, catch any exceptions thrown above uh, the catch operator. So, I mean, if you don't want to use the, the catch operator, you can even throw in the classic try catch block. It will behave exactly similar to the catch operator. Um, I would recommend to use the catch operator instead of the classic try catch, but there can be use cases when you want to, you know, like have more control and use the classic try catch. Sure, go ahead. Just make sure that during those time to ignore the cancellation exception because you don't want to emit an error when your flow or coroutine was canceled. So for example, when your activity was closed or paused, something like that, uh, you don't want that. Um, so whenever, the, whenever your activity would be closed or paused, um, the coroutine would be canceled and the cancellation exception would be thrown. So you don't want to handle that. Uh, you, you, know, you don't want to like, like uh, give that exception upstream uh, for your UI to do something uh, when your activity is closed. So, just make sure to like skip that one. So yeah, and this is pretty much how the cat, the, the catch operator by Kotlin team works internally. Or you can specifically handle the exception you expect to see. For example, in case of database, um, uh, database operation, you would specifically want to, um, you, 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 you might have an idea that uh, there is always gonna be an IO exception or something that so you can specifically handle the IO exception in that case, you don't need to, you know, like um, even while using the classic try catch block, you don't need to use the, uh, you don't need to handle the cancellation exception. And the, uh, the, and the value emitted from the catch is like uh, again received in the collect. So that means that there is only one single place for all types of like cases to be handled. So either it's a success or either it's a failure, everything comes down to the collect block. And this makes it like super transparent to handle all the classes at one place. So if you wanted to update your UI, you would put uh, you, you, in the collect block, you would, um, you could like detect if it's a, if it's an exception or if it's a success and based upon that, you would deal with the UI. So I would recommend to toss in sealed classes uh, so you can cover all your cases all the time and update the UI based upon the state of the uh, state of the flow. And then really amazing. So at this point, you might be confused, like when to use coroutines, basically like the suspend and when to use flow. So uh, here's the rule of thumb. So use suspend for one shot operations, like um, uh, for like for like inserting into database or like doing get or post network operations or something, which is like one shot basically. And then use flow when there is a stream of data involved. For example, uh, you, um, you want to get data from the database and want to update the UI of, uh, of your app immediately whenever there are changes to the database. I think in, in those cases, use the flow. 
And then uh, th there is another concept um, with flow, which is channels. So channels are like communication primitives and uh, flow, um, a lot of features of flow are built on top of channels and they are like very primit uh, low level primitives to use. So, um, so basically like the channels are like how the name suggests, like they, they allow to send and receive data between different routines like the so they are used to like come they are used as a communication between different core routines so the idea here uh, with channels is to use information sharing um, instead of a shared mutable memory because at this point we know that in computer programming whenever like there's shared mutable memory you need lock and all the stuff which is like super fancy um, so channels rather instead of using mutable like the shared mutable memory they rely on communication for sharing information basically. Um, and then, uh, so the coroutine that produces information is called as a producer and the coroutine that receives the information is called as a consumer, like pretty obvious. And uh, at this point, you might have realized that the channels are hot in nature uh, and hence they're not the best candidate to use all the time. And again, like, um, like I said, like channels are low level primitives and Kotlin flow internally is built using coroutines and channels. So generally, like try to use flow as more as uh, like as as much as possible for your use cases instead of channels. But like that said, like there uh, you can still uh, you should still use channels, uh, but just be more careful with their hot like the since they're hot in nature and you need to do like special handling for the cancellation etc. So let's take an example to understand like uh, um, how channels work. So in this case, uh, we will use like conflated broadcast channel. So which is basically a broadcast channel, how we saw, like it's a channel. Uh, so uh, it's, it's a channel, but it's a broadcast channel, which means that it allows to broadcast or send values to everyone. And, and the conflated part means that it only sends the recent values to every subscriber. Uh, and so basically whenever there's a subscriber which subscribes to it or a collector which subscribes to it, they will immediately receive the recently sent value. Kind of love, kind of like behavior subject, I guess, in Arif Jama. But yeah. Um, and, um, and somewhere from your activity or fragment, when the search text changes, you would call the send function on the channel, which will emit a new value to its uh, observers. And then on the receiving end, you can convert the channel to flow, do some mapping operation to get the result for the, uh, like the specified search query. And then, you know, like take only the unique results using the distinct until change operator and finally render the, render the result on the UI. So this is an example of how you would, uh, a practical example of how you would use flow and channels in your application. Um, but like I said, um, channels are low level and you should try, uh, like try to avoid them and use flow as much as possible. And, and Kotlin team is working on that. It's a known problem and Kotlin team is working on that. And they are trying to make more um, like those, those use cases to where you need channels as flow. So one of them is like the state flow, which was recently introduced. Um, so state, play, state flow is a, another primitive and it's a type of flow. Uh, and it's designed to emit updates to its collector and it will eventually replace the conflated broadcast channel, which we just saw. So let's take the same example, which we just saw, but in terms of state flow. So uh, it's pretty similar to the previous example. So there is a state flow and there is a mutable state flow. The difference is that the mutable, as the name suggests, allows setting the value to the flow and the state flow one doesn't allow, it's not a readable one. Uh, it's only readable, sorry. So make sure to always expose state flow outside of the class to avoid any side effects. So going with on the same example, so whenever there is a text change, we will set the value to the flow. And whenever this value is updated, the collectors will receive it. And, and like every other flow, we can just directly collect it and listen to the updates and uh, update the UI. One key thing to remember with state flow is that the operator distinct until change is automatically applied. Um, so you don't need to do it manually. Uh, and and, and in, in case you manually add it, the IDE will uh, give you a warning. Um, so that's, that's a good thing. Um, okay, so at this point, now we know what is flow, we know channels, um, and, and now you might be thinking, okay, I like it, I wanna migrate to flow. Um, 
and I, and I agree like a lot of code bases are stuck with legacy code uh, legacy code either like callbacks you know like rx java loaders or any other old asynchronous programming apis and it's totally fine uh, if it's working great um, if it's working it's great but the problem lies with the slower and hard code maintenance um, and re- and the refactoring whenever there is a new a new requirement and and this slows the efficiency and the velocity of developing the given requirement so uh, if you are looking to migrate there are like two things to look out for migration the the first thing is setting up the process with the team uh, which is like super important so the whole team works towards the single goal of migration uh, so there is no this is not a rule of thumb and and these migration steps and process which i'm suggesting are just my recommendations which we tried at clue uh, with with uh, with the android team at clue um so yeah like feel free to make some changes over there and again these are just recommendation uh, so first one is like um the first order of business is to discuss within your team and try to figure out what's what alternative to pick that works for your team and your, and the use case you are trying to solve um so i would recommend to do uh, to do something as follow um to get started and decide what other tool suits the best for your code base so first start off with uh, setting up a meeting with a team list out all the possible alternatives uh, which which are possible uh, for your use case like rx java 2 3 or flow and then discuss the pros cons and advantages of all the options and then uh, once something uh, once you have something decided in, uh, during the meeting then it's best uh, to uh, if the team gets to try out and get comfortable with the option which you all like uh this might include like doing a small sample app giving an internal presentation or uh, sharing some good, useful articles talks like this one etc and then uh once like everyone is comfortable now it's time to evaluate like how hard the migration of certain option uh might look like for your code base and, and also like the learning curve of this new tool um for your new joiners to the team so for instance like uh, we at clue migrated from rx java 1 to flow and we had to evaluate like if we wanted to migrate from rx java 1 to 2 or 3 and at that time our co- uh, for our code base um, it would have been super hard and uh, to migrate from rx java 1 to 2 uh, so we re- and then also like on the other hand we really liked flow and everyone felt comfortable with and that's how we uh, decided to like, how we evaluated to move from rx java 1 to flow and at the end of this basically you will have a common goal in mind uh for example that would be like let's say are moving migrating from rx java 1 to flow and you would like and the entire team would like focus on this common goal so okay the second is like setting up the foundation and setting the foundation is very key to the whole migration because this is what will motivate the entire team to write new code in flow or whatever is decided you don't want any developer to like start writing a new feature in flow and then realize oh no there is no testing framework and how would i write test in flow and then the developer will be like okay let's go back to the comfort zone uh, since all of us are human we will go back to the comfort zone and the newer code will also not be in flow yeah and then the migration will be super slow and stuff um so for so, so setting up the foundation would so first off like start off like creating guidelines like of how um, like basically with standard practices of how the team decided to use flow throughout the code base and uh, and create a document or something and put it in the repository basically and in the second step create necessary base classes for your code base uh, to work with your architecture including the dependencies for flow like testing dependency stuff and base classes could be like you know um, making your presenter support coroutines so in our case we are still using mvp and uh, so we made the mvp a uh, coroutine scope uh, so that like anyone anyone could use coroutines or flow in their presenters so doing stuff like that creating necessary base classes so that everyone can use flow uh, as efficient as possible and the third one is like the testing this uh, many a lot of people forget this but like uh, it's important like when you are setting up the foundation to set up a te- testing framework or like utilities basically um to make it easier to you know create test in to do test on flow um like this can be setting up the dispatcher uh, assert item utility stuff like that 
and like each code base ha uh, has some apis which are commonly used by a lot of features uh, in the uh, in the whole app so for example um, it would be like getting the user's details like email address or password stuff like that so you why um, you could like expose this common apis as flow um, so uh, let's let's dive deeper and take an example here so there is a function called as observe user which is exposes an observable of user one approach is to convert this function like the entire function to flow or coroutine which is great if it's possible but it's not feasible always right like to convert the whole thing um the another approach is to duplicate this base api and expose the duplicated api as flow or coroutine and marking the legacy function as deprecated so everyone uh everyone like who writes the new code uh, will use the new function and avoid the legacy one and eventually with time everyone uses the new function and you can remove the legacy one um here like one key thing to note is like try to when when you create this equivalent function uh try to extract the business logic into a third function which is like private or something um so that like these two like exposed public apis will share the same function internally so that whenever you need to update something you don't need to update it twice oh yeah deprecated <laughs> um yeah uh setting up safeguards so now uh, everyone is like super motivated uh, to write kotlin coroutines the goal is decided so the safeguards will help um help the entire team uh prevent or like kind of force the team to write more and more code in kotlin flow and uh, or coroutines and also prevent uh, and also help you convert the legacy code so each code um so so uh, so some of this example is like uh, ensuring that the new code is written uh, is written using kotlin coroutines ah oh, sorry yeah so first one is like ensuring that each new code is written using kotlin coroutines um while doing the pr reviews um like and whenever the legacy code is touched uh, the developer has tried to convert it to coroutines or flow so uh, while reviewing the pr the reviewer can like uh, say that okay the legacy code was touched have you tried converting it to flow or uh, coroutine if 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 you haven't then why or stuff like that so i think these safeguards will prevent um um the entire team from falling back into the legacy API, using the legacy stuff again and try to kind of force them to move towards using flow or like whatever the new tool which you have decided and the third point is like uh, doing a quarterly or a monthly check of progress like how the gradual migration is going on i think this is super important and this uh, kind of reinforces and motivates the entire team seeing that okay now uh, there is progress happening and it makes the whole team happy so i think it's super important to to ha ha have a check of progress and then some other cool ideas which will definitely pop in your brilliant mind um um okay so uh, interoperability is one uh, while migrating from legacy the key to success of java kotlin migration was interoperability and the ease of using one from another which opened the door for gradual migration of kotlin java so uh, similarly having this ability to quickly interop between legacy code and flow or coroutines can drastically change the landscape and flow provides an amazing api to convert any legacy based api to flow so let's say you have this function which has a classic callback listener pattern and it the, basically the listener is called each time the document is updated um, and you want to do something whenever the the listener is called um and also like with this classic callback mechanism you need to make sure that this listener is removed whenever the component is destroyed like whenever the activity is destroyed for example so flow provides an amazing api called as callback flow uh, in order to convert this legacy ones to a uh, to a flow where you can like write the legacy so where you can like first like start off writing the legacy listener aka the callback um and then uh, there is something called as offer which basically means um emit this value each time the document is updated um but at this point you might be wondering okay updating the value is fine but like where do we remove the listener like we need to do that at some point right so uh, there is also a solution for that there is something called as await close uh, which is called whenever the coroutine or uh, or flow is cancelled uh, and this is a very safe place where you can uh, remove the the listeners so finally with code comments uh, it will look something like this which a lot of people forget just saying 
um okay so a lot of uh, people might want to migrate from rx to flow um so the goal here is not to tell you to go next moment and migrate from flow to like from rx to flow i mean that would be great for your own projects but yeah um but just to show you if you want to then how you can migrate to uh, migrate from rx to flow so rx java uh, so flow and rx java follow the same reactive stream specification so in theory it's very easy to convert data streams from rx java to flow and the reverse um and uh, th there is a, a, a artifact for that like kotlin coroutines rx java 2 artifact which allows you to convert um uh like convert from flow to observable and observable to flow and uh, so basically like uh, moving one step back there are like two ways to convert first is like to refactor your rx java implementation like the this flow function over here um to you to be to use flow instead of observable in first place but it's time consuming and sometimes you would just want to just switch the type so you can gradually like do a gradual migration to flow so in that cases use the as flow extension function which allows you to quickly switch the type from flowable or observable to flow and and the same can be done to convert flow to observable or flowable when you need it so here is a quick comparison of terminologies between rx java and coroutine which i again which i stole from clues documentation in my defense i created this table at clues so i can i think i can steal it uh, but anyway use this chart as a reference when you are new to coroutines world or working on migrating from rx java to coroutines flow or reverse maybe um so let's look at something funny so the you remember the as flow function so the as flow function actually uses callback function internally to convert the flow uh, like convert the observable to flow which is so cool okay now uh, maybe some of you might be stuck with rx java 1 instead of 2 which was in our case uh, at clue so if your code base is stuck with rx java 1 and you want to move away i would recommend to migrate to kotlin flow rather than migrating to rx java 2 or 3 since rx java 1 bindings are not officially supported i have created the library and there is the link below uh, for the to if you want to use this library for your use case um it of basically it offers the same api as uh, the uh, rx java 2 artifact um it uh, gives you the extension functions to convert flow to observable and observable to flow now to everyone's favorite topping testing so testing flow or coroutines is pretty easy Uh, so let's start off by taking a simple flow of string um, and write the test function and use the run blocking coroutine scope because we want our test to wait till the coroutine is complete, right? Or they will pass even by, even without checking if you don't use run blocking. <laughs> um, and like I said, uh, flow is similar to a list or a collection, so you can use take operator to pick the first value from the stream, then con uh, then convert it into a list. and then you can easily assert the list it's very similar to how you would do with a list and um um or or you can create a extension function which i installed from clues documentation in my defense i created so i can steal it um anyway um so with the extension function it will look much more cleaner um you can just like call this and assert the items yeah i i just want to chime in real quick that yeah we are at time so um If you have any questions, I think we should probably take them to the Slack room. But I'll let you wrap up real quick. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Awesome. Okay. So to conclude, here's a quick summary of what you learned today. We revisited core routines. We saw why Kotlin Flow came into picture. What makes it special? Basics of Flow. That is the emitter and collector and how they work internally. Then we saw principles of Flow, um, which is the context preservation, exception transparency, and how they make our life easy. and then how to convert uh, from legacy code or rx java to flow and how you can test your flows and some pro tips along the way to conclude like kotlin flow raises the bar and makes reactive stream like reactive programming easy and gives us like uh, gives us great kotlin features and that's it it's still work in progress i mean it's production ready and everything we are also using in production um but there's like a bunch of things which are still in progress and coming and lot of exciting things are coming soon So here are some further resources um, uh, to if you want to look more, um, and also make sure to check out the Kotlin uh, online event which is happening in a few days to hear more updates on Kotlin Flow and coroutines. And yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, again, because we are a little bit over time, um, mm -hmm. if you 
if the if the presenter doesn't mind hanging out for a few more minutes, or you can I would love the black one. Okay. Yeah. I'm uh, go ahead and uh, if you scroll up in the chat, you'll see some questions that folks had. Okay. Let me open chat. Okay. So the first one is so much simpler than Arigdava. Oh, okay. Sorry, it's not a question. <laughs> um is it possible to throw inside the catch operator for some other yeah uh yeah, yeah i mean um yes that is possible um so you, you can throw inside a catch operator and the downstream catch operator will catch it and also one more thing is like if in case you don't have a catch operator uh, um uh, and you're still throwing an exception you can still have um uh, exception handler um i i can put that in the slack which where which is like a global source of catching all the exception uh, actors 10 minutes left recommend for unit testing flow okay it, uh, uh, so there is one question about what do you recommend for unit testing flow i think uh, you can uh, so there there is a dependency uh, uh, like a coroutine kotlin coroutine test dependency which is which just basically gives you the run blocking test function or the run blocking functions uh, not the run blocking but the run blocking test so i think you just need that but like apart from testing the flow itself it's pretty easy you can do it similar to a list or something like that so yeah uh, how can you use flows from java hmm yeah, this is a really interesting one. I am not exactly sure, and I don't know how much they really support. Um, but yeah, it's it's a really interesting question. Like I, I yeah, I wish I knew the answer. Uh, there's one more. Uh, can you can you have timeout with collect individual emissions or total emissions? Hmm. Yeah, I think I have a follow up for that. Maybe I can take that take this one in Slack. Yeah. I think that's it or ah, there is one more collect is like promise in JS. Um, I'm not sure. Like I haven't used promise in JavaScript, but yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not sure about that one. Yeah. But about the, the question about the timeout. Yeah. I'll uh, take it on Slack because I, I have follow up question about that. Oh, yeah, I think that's all I think for questions. If anyone has more. Cool. Well, if that's it, um, I think we're going to end the Zoom and feel free to follow up in Slack. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Bye.